Two worlds separated by thousands of miles, but for the past few months they've shared the same sense of outrage. The provocation came from Danish newspaper Jyllandsposten. It published 12 drawings of the Prophet Muhammad, some relating to violence or the oppression of women. And suddenly, Muslims around the world turned against this little country they'd hardly noticed before. But for people in Denmark, the conflict between Danes and Danish Muslims came as no surprise. Tegningerne var jo blot kulminationen af den debat, der har foregået om islam i mange år i Danmark, hvor man omtaler islam som kvindeundertrykkende, som en terrorreligion og så videre. Der er jo stadigvæk en en kløft, fordi øh, de folk, vi har fået fra Vellemøsten, har en anderledes tilgang til til verden, til, til samfundet, end, end vi danskere har. Most outsiders probably couldn't place Denmark on a map. It's five and a half million people, the oldest monarchy in the world. Mention Denmark, and people think of the Little Mermaid or fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen, perhaps Kierkegaard's philosophy. But this is also Denmark. About 700 of Denmark's more than 200,000 Muslims are gathered this Friday, like any other, for prayers. We are here in the center, in the heart of Copenhagen. We talk about Islam freely. We conduct our activities. Egyptian Imam Ahmed Abu Laban came here 22 years ago. The first big wave of immigrants came to Denmark before that, in the 60s, as guest workers to help a starving Danish labor market. But shortly after, the market conditions took a turn. The oil crisis came, and suddenly there was not uh, work enough for everybody, and that uh, that hit the immigrants uh, particularly hard. Torben Müller Hansen manages the New Danes organization formed to fight the high unemployment among immigrants. Getting a job is a crucial uh, part of, of, of your identity and your ability to say I'm integrated into the society. Vi danskere har en, en fælles kultur, en fælles forståelse, fælles værdi og fælles opfattelse, og på den måde hører sammen som et homogent folk. Og derfor har det været en meget stor rystelse, øh, at øh, så mange er kommet udefra. What's behind me is the main hospital of Copenhagen. It's one of the images of the social welfare system existing in this country. You can go to the hospital for free. You go to the doctor for free. You have a minimum of five weeks of vacation as an employee. And if you're young and you want to go to the university, the state will actually pay you to study. But that means in almost all kinds of jobs, you're expected to be educated. It's not only education, it's Danish education. We have special licensed Danish educations. And to get that, you need to speak Danish. Denmark forventer de, at du bare lige hurtigt kommer ind i samfundet, ind i varmen, skal lære dansk at kende, kan sproget, kan kulturen, men det er altså virkelig svært. Iman is 18 years old and grew up here. Her parents are Syrian. Vi kan have mange af de her problemer i min skole, hvor øh, vi skal mødes og vi skal drikke. Og så begynder diskussionen. Nej, vi må ikke være et sted, hvor der drikkes. Hvorfor? Hvorfor? Det var sådan, kan jeg ikke bare acceptere det sådan? Er det bare, de tænker, hvorfor kan der være en religion, som skal bestemme over dit liv og skal forhindre dig i at den lyde? Allahu akbar. Altså uanset hvor, hvor jeg bor hen i verden så er det jo stadigvæk en religiøs pligt. Allah, kom op. tiltrækning for eksempel, den vil ikke finde sted, når man uh, er tiltrækket og har tørklæde på. Da jeg var 16 år gammel, min lærer havde spurgt mig, om jeg ikke ville optræde med det her dans til sådan en uh, award-uddeling. Og så spurgte jeg min far, og han kiggede på mig, og så sagde han, du må gerne uh, danse uh, foran 1000 mennesker i cirkusbygningen, eller hvor det var, men så må du skifte dit efternavn. 
Shirin Khan grew up in Denmark with a Syrian dad and a Finnish mom. Today she's explaining some of the basics of Islam to a Danish advertising company. Altså dansk er noget der foregår hjemme. Men er det noget med det der med udstillelser? Det har noget at gøre med blufærdighed, tror jeg. A few years ago, Khan Khan started an association based on what's called Euro Islam. Euro Islam is much about how do we make this um, balance between being a Muslim, being faithful to the Islamic principles, and at the same time living in a Western society. However, politician Pia Kersko does not believe those two ideals are compatible. As a new free, women in this part of the world. Det er mange år siden, at vi har fået de rettigheder, som vi har i dag, og vi har kæmpet for det. Og der føler vi nok, at, øh, at vi bliver bombet noget tilbage. Vi kan ikke acceptere det, vi vil ikke acceptere det. Kærsgaard leads the People's Party, influential conservatives known for promoting some of the toughest immigration policies in Europe. Der er jo en frygt for, også med de fremskrivninger, vi ser, at muslimer en dag vil være i overtal. Og det er jo en udvikling, som man ikke skal... Øh, Altså den skal man jo ikke bare lade far frem. Der er man nødt til at sætte et stop. People always just see them as 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 stupid rednecks who uh, who are racist, but they're not. They're uh, red good, you know, intelligent rednecks who are good politicians too. And that's the worst kind. <laughs> Egyptian Danish comedian Omar Masuk is born and raised in Denmark. Oh yeah, tror jeg lige til at His humor challenges political correctness. Mor, hvad vil du sige? Den amerikanske ambassade, er det den vej eller den vej der? Nu er jeg eneste. Ved I, ved I det? Den amerikanske ambassade, den vej. Ja. Right, how about it? Well, I grew up in what you call the ghetto. It's the Danish version of the ghetto. It's mainly immigrants who live there and drunk Danish people. So I guess that's why it's a ghetto. In some suburbs, building after building is almost only inhabited by immigrant families, and often their children commit far more crime than their numbers would suggest. If there's no criminality or there's no problem, it will show people that it's a new generation in the other. Why? Because he's blue and Danish, so he's just born in Denmark. We have to get rid of the term. How many generations do we need in order to get rid of this term? We invited people that were very different to us here, and we left them in tw in 20 years. We left them with to take care of themselves, and then in the 90s suddenly we said, "Well, why haven't they assimilated?" In many small the number one reason: ask the Muslims, and they'll say the media. There are a media uh, demonization of what Islam is. Ahmed Akari came to Denmark with his parents from Lebanon. Every time you are in media, you get a picture of it's something with terrorism or danger. But perhaps not without reason. In a new French documentary, Akari issued what Danes considered a threat to a popular politician, Nasser Kader. If he becomes minister charge of étrangers or minister of integration, ne faudrait il pas que deux mecs aillent le voir pour le faire exploser lui et son ministère? Akari claims it was a joke, but Nasser Kader isn't laughing. I mean, at the end, the Kassoum's dust of unity that hold. Originally from Syria, Qatar's now a member of parliament. He's almost used to death threats by now, and most of them come from fellow Muslims angry that he dares to criticize them. Flertal af muslimerne, der intet har med dem at gøre, de bør ikke lade deres vrede gå ud mod danskerne, som de synes skal være imod muslimerne. De skal lade deres hovedvrede gå imod islamisterne, og det er det, jeg savner. Tag afstand fra det hele tiden. Det er som om, det er det, vi bliver bedt om, for at de kan se, at det ikke er alle sammen, der er på den måde. Og det kan være irritende nogle gange, fordi man, he man hele tiden skal stå og tage ansvar for andres øh, handlinger. But what often causes the biggest conflicts are not extremists, but the smaller things in everyday life. Når en påberuber sig for mange rettigheder, at øh, man for eksempel forlanger fra forældres side, at... Øh, Piger og drenge skal kønsopdeles, når de går til svømning. Det går jo altså også ud over de danske børn. Og hvor man øh, har andre spisevaner, mange daginstitutioner nu, bliver pålagt alene at have halalkød. I have diabetes, I need a special diet. 
you are vegetarian and this uh, uh, person is a Jew, he will demand kosher uh, and I am a Muslim, I will demand halal meat. What's the problem? Man kan sige relativt små ting, men noget af det, som er med til at ændre vores samfund. So where does Denmark go from here? It's clear that the young Muslims are more integrated in the Danish society. But many say they expect to be more religious than their parents. Når man kommer til Danmark, så bliver man mere hvad hedder det, opmærksom på sin religion. Og på den måde, så går folk mere op i religion. Vi går meget op i, at det skal være sådan en islamisk opdragelse. We are pretty much getting into a new period where we admit that diversity and internationalism is also Denmark. Jeg kan ikke leve et andet sted, fordi du kan blande kultur sammen og tage det bedste ud fra hver kultur, så du ender med et perfekt menneske. On a houseboat in San Francisco Bay, a group of environmentalists welcome a longtime friend, Russian environmental leader Misha Shishin. He's come 10,000 miles to gather support for the cause he values most. Shishin and David Gordon have worked together for more than a decade to protect Siberian wilderness. They've done it with a combination of American dollars and Russian grassroots muscle. The fights going on here to protect our wild places are fights over postage stamps in comparison to some of the wilderness that is uh, by fate really still undeveloped. Shishin and Gordon met at the end of the Cold War during a time when citizens exchanges were aimed at reducing the threat of nuclear war. <laughs> Today's exchanges serve a very different purpose. Shishin's trip to California is aimed at saving the wilderness at Siberia's southernmost tip the Altai. Altai is an ancient crossroads of civilization at the junction of the steppes of Kazakhstan and the semi-deserts of Mongolia. The size of Indiana, it is home to only 200,000 people. Russians constitute a majority in a region that is home also to Kazakhs and the ethnic Altai, whose reverence for the land and rivers like the Khatung are deeply embedded in an ancient culture. Да, вот есть мой друг алтаец, и он считает, Катунь – это священная река. Просто священная и так далее. Может быть, я даже так не переживаю вот это. Но я считаю, что вот если хотя бы один человек говорит, что это моя святыня, то мы никто не имеем права нарушить это. The Russian government felt otherwise. Altai's remoteness and sparse population made it an ideal dumping ground for the space program and the military. Over a 40-year period, thousands of tons of toxic rocket parts and ballistic missiles fell from the sky onto nature preserves, livestock, and people's homes. Вспоминаю себя там в момент такого романтического увлечения космосом, в космос полетели. Я теперь спокойно не могу смотреть на эти запуски, хоть российские, хоть китайские, хоть американские. Это чудовищная вообще деятельность, чудовищная просто. Человечество должно немножко остановиться. Any romantic notion died for the people of Altai when babies were born with something called yellow children's syndrome. Babies were born prematurely. Their skin had a yellow hue, and after a month, the yellow would fade, giving way to a variety of health problems. Shishin began to investigate. In the absence of information from the government and media coverage of the issue, Shishin formed his own television station, Katung TV. He was an art collector and professor of philosophy when a proposal for a major dam project on Altai's Katung River first surfaced. Это, это в детстве произошло. Я очень любил природу. В России была очень хорошая традиция. Достоевский, Эмерсон в Америке. И мне кажется, что нам как бы надо повернуться вот к этой истории. Вот. Shishin was convinced that the dam would flood thousands of acres and important archaeological sites. The environmental movement was one of the first social movements to develop 
at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union that was spurred on by things like the Chernobyl ta catastrophe and the organizing that Mita Shishin did around the Khatun Dam that again became a na national movement to protect the Khatun River. Shishin's campaign and the opening of Soviet society attracted activists from all over the country. And many people uh, looked for their own way, their new conditions, new possibilities, and so on. And we were young and romantic, and we uh, told each other, let's go to Alta and live there, and help to save Khatun. Shishin's efforts caught the eye of American nonprofits as well. In the early 90s, Pacific Environment began sponsoring annual conferences in Russia that helped grow the network of activists opposing the Khatun Dam. With some American support, activism in Russia took on its own unique appearance. We were uh, writing our message for the public stop at the Katoon Dam. In 1998, the United Nations recognized the Golden Mountains of Altai World Heritage Site. Thanks to international recognition and continued grassroots pressure, proposals to dam the river have been kept at bay until now. Private companies are proposing a new plan for damming the Khatoum. There are new threats as well. This spring, the Kremlin renewed its commitment to build a natural gas pipeline through Altai. Мы ставим там плотину и получаем электричество, и кто-то обязательно будет богатым от этого. Supporters of new development say the projects could help the region modernize. Environmentalists are not so sure. We think it'll again be a lot of broken promises for the lo local communities. So those local communities are often put in places where they have to agree to large extractive resource projects, even though those local communities don't benefit from them. The problem is not only in uh, building the cartoon dam uh, in itself. It, is, uh, it will be the precedent, precedent uh, for total industrial development of Altai. From his visits to the states, Shishin is learning from the early missteps of the American environmental movement. If we do some kind of reaction, we try to look at it very carefully, give it good foundation. Shishin is proposing the use of wind and solar energy in place of a dam or pipeline. He brought an elected official from Altai to view the technology. Sergei Grushchushnikov says Altai's energy development, green or no, is not just about company profits, it's about survival. Поэтому население вынуждено, чтобы не замерзнуть в зимнее время, рубить лес, готовить дрова, Shishin returns to Russia as a law takes effect restricting his foreign funding. While the Kremlin says the law is needed to prevent terrorism and foreign influence in Russian politics, many in Altai say that without American support, their cause may be lost. Our opponents sometimes says, or oh, you take foreign money, and we says, uh, we will be glad to take Russian money, but you uh, do not uh, give it to us. <laughs> In the days before the law went into effect, Pacific Environment unloaded $175,000 to Russian environmental groups. But that money won't last long. It will be a true test of Shishin's resolve and Russia's emerging grassroots networks. into something beautiful. After years of organizing and fundraising, it was time for a celebration. The gala opening reception was for an art show that no New York gallery would host. So organizers had to raise more than $40,000 to rent this Chelsea space for the events. You actually get to see the suffering, you get to see like the emotion.
traveling show features work by more than 20 artists living in the occupied West Bank and Gaza, in Israel, and from the worldwide Palestinian diaspora. Common themes in the show ranged from traditional symbols like the olive tree, commentary on life under the Israeli military occupation, and universal images of loss and displacement. The origins of this contemporary Palestinian art lie in a little-known culture far from Manhattan. Under Israeli occupation since 1967, the West Bank city of Ramallah has always been an economic and cultural capital, and today is a bustling urban center. Ramallah is also the kind of place with a touch of chaos, and where artistic expression is everywhere you turn. For International Theater Day, Normally weary people stopped to watch performances in the middle of the city. For some, this seems strange. But this scene that contradicted usual images of the Palestinian streets made a lot of people happy. In fact, art shows are common at Ramallah's handful of galleries despite the hardships. And artists have a strong presence in Ramallah many even responsible for the work exhibited in New York. Tamari is a well-known artist in Palestine and abroad and teaches at Birzeit University. Sliman Mansour is known for nationalistic themes and scenes of the Palestinian land that are imbued with symbolism. فعشت أنا طفولتي في بيرزيت بيرزيت في عنا أرض فيها زيتون وفيها عين مي صغيرة وفيها شجر مثمر خوخ وطين وكذا فأقضي يعني معظم الوقت في في البر بالأرض واضح واضح كان أكثر من هلا بكثير إنه في أرض محتلة وإنه إحنا تحت الاحتلال وهم محتلينا فأنا بتصور أنه أن لو ما في قضية فلسطينية بجوز ما أكونش فنان Zuhdi al-Adawi currently lives in a refugee camp in Syria but his path in art started as a child in the Gaza Strip where his parents became refugees after being driven out of Lidda in 1948 In the that I lived the 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 كانت عندي أحلام أرسم الفن طبعا أجا تراكم أفكار صار عندي تراكم أفكار من خلال الثقافة اللي تعلمتها في السجن فالأفكار هذه بدنا نحاول نصبها على المساحة البيضة These artists belong to a contemporary Palestinian art movement that has gained increased visibility recently evidenced by high profile art shows and scholarly recognition This groundbreaking book written by an art historian from Hebrew University in Jerusalem is a study of the little documented Palestinian art before 1948 and how the creation of the State of Israel that year changed the course of this art movement and the lives of many. And Cory's book points to Ismail Shamut as one of the pioneers of this movement. He now lives in Amman, Jordan with his artist wife, Tamam. <laughs> وأخرجنا بالقوة 
فكرنا بانه احنا رايحين واخرة النهار راجعين لذلك خرجنا بهدومنا لم نحمل شيء من بيوت من من بيتنا اطلاقا جمعنا بعشرات الالاف من الناس بداوا فتحوا ثغره من لهذا الجمع بانه يمشي في اتجاه معين بالقوه والجنود الاسرائيليين يعني او الصهاينه مسلحين ومحتاطين ودبابه محيطين بنا فاضطرينا نمشي وحسينا انه هاي الطريق تخرجنا من المدينه هنا بدانا نتساءل انه على فين؟ الى اين؟ كان السؤال الى اين؟ وهذه اللوحه اسمها الى اين؟ شموت describes a day and a half journey to Ramallah with his family. He saw people die of thirst along the way. This infamous march to exile is part of an experience shared by more than 700,000 Palestinians who either fled or were driven from their homes. Now, 58 years later, their children and grandchildren still carry the memory of what happened. When war came to the Palestinian people again in 1967, the art movement was fueled and changed yet again. بصراحة يعني شفت أشياء أثرت فيه زي كيف؟ أشو اللي شفتها؟ إسرائيل لما دخلت على القطاع دخلت احتلال الطائرات الدبابات كله دخل القطاع الناس صارت كلها تحكي إنها تقاوم الاحتلال هذا احتلال صار أجا علينا في أي واحد بده يشتغل في المقاومة يا بده يستشهد يموت يا بده يعتقل فأنا حظ السيء اعتقلت والله هو يعني التفاصيل يمكن صعبة شوي بس لا أحكي لك كانت المقاومة مسلحة وأنا شاركت في هذه المقاومة الفن على فكرة ساعدنا أتخيل هلأ السجين لما يحطوه بغرفة 22 ساعة متواصلة صعب يضل وقع الغرفة عليه صعب يضل والسجن بس كان ما عندوش خيال يتخيل بالصعب بالكنيسة يطلعوا قانون بأنه عالم فلسطين ممنوع وقالوا لنا بكل بساطة انه ممنوع احنا نرسم بالالوان الاحمر والاسود والاخضر والابيض وحتى بتذكر يا نبيل يا عصام سأل طب اذا احنا رسمنا بطيخة ما هي الالوان هذه قال بتتصادر العمل طبعا كنا معلوم كنا كتير نتبع على ايش بدنا نعمل ايش بدنا نعملش وين نعرض وين نعرضش ويا ما اجوا الجيش وداهموا المعارض واخدوا لوحات و كثير كثير اللوحه بتحكي عن اللي بيهاجروا برا وكيف بضلوا حاملين القضيه يعني والقضيه وزنها عليهم برضه مش 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 اقل منا احنا اللي عايشين هون يعني يعرفوا انه في شعب اللي هو بنبض بالحياه وفي حد حياه اللي عنده امكانيات مش يعني مش شعب همجي ولا شعب متاخر ولا متكلف ان عندنا فنوننا وعندنا افكارنا عندنا شعراءنا عندنا موسيقانا واحنا فخورين في هذا. انا بامن يعني لحد اليوم انه الفن اذا ما كان في مسج من وراه ما ممنوع الواحد ليش يضيع وقته يعني يعمل شيء بوينتلس يعني مش له هدف مش له شيء بس اللي بيكون عايش بفلسطين وبجو احتلال وب... والاسرائيليين الجيش الاسرائيلي بدخل باللون اللي بدك انت تحطيه على اللوحه تبعتك، كيف انا بدي اعمل شيء ما في له دخل بالسياسه؟ في نفاق كبير بصير وقتها. As artists record their memories, hopes, and the Palestinian story, they're also doing something else. Their work serves as a record of history, of identity, and of dreams of a homeland.